Did I just get a woo? Ah, oh, this is good. Okay, um, thank you very, very much for inviting me to give a talk. This is my first Skeptic Society. Um, I was just in the discussion panel room and I've already ranted, so I think I'm, I feel like I'm settling in nicely. Is, is, that, is ranting allowed? <laughs> so I'm going to be talking about um, this idea of whether cleanliness is a good or a bad thing. Um, and hopefully you will draw your own conclusions from the discussion. So I'm, I'm an immunologist, so I'm going to talk to you about the immune system, the body's defense system, and I'm also going to talk to you about my other great love, which is parasitic worms. So this is a talk where I get to combine two. Okay, so the first thing is to sort of think about how fantastic your body's defense system is, your immune system is, is to think about everything that you meet every day of your life. We're under attack, constantly. Think about your journey here, even my journey here. It was further than you think, just about. Okay, so we commute. Um, so this is the underground, but you know, you've had plane journeys, train journeys, bus journeys, and you get unbelievably close to some people. We've all been stood under the armpit, getting just so close, and God knows what these people have got. They could be full of the cold or flu. They could be vomiting, not on the, on the train. Well, actually, I have been on the train when people have been vomiting, but that was alcohol-induced, not infection. They could have a fever. And then we have these other wonderful sources, children and puppies and animals. Now, you see, when I give that slide to my undergrads, they all go, oh, but this is skeptics, nobody's gone, oh. <laughs> OK, so our body's defense system is essentially, it's evolved to deal with all these infectious organisms. And the reason we're not ill every day is because our body's immune system is helping us not be ill. It recognizes things it's met before and protects us against further infection. In fact, that is the basis of vaccination. But infection is still very, very significant. Around 60% of deaths were due to infection, and that was just in the ninth, up to the 19th century alone. And even nowadays, in the modern age, infection is the number one cause of death in the under, eight, under 50s, not the under 80s, in the under 50s. If you make it past 50, you're more likely to die of cancer or cardiovascular disease. And this is a mortality curve that illustrates that. So we like a graph, I'm a scientist, we have to have a graph. So these lines here basically show you the life expectancy. So this is survival up here, and this is years of age. And you can see we've got data from the Paleolithic era, the Neolithic era and the Breslau era, and Liverpool in 1860. Not picking on Liverpool. It, probably was the same everywhere. And you can see that the life expectancy isn't fantastic. It's probably around about 40 or less. Um, big jump to the UK in 2000. You see our life expectancy is really shot up, and most people are living well into their 70s. If you live in Mozambique, the news isn't so good. Life expectancy really isn't much different to Liverpool in 1860. And this is all really down to infection. So let's look at kind of the why we've changed. So why do we live longer? Let's look at a bit of history. So let's look at then. OK, so this is a slide showing you a few different things. So I'm going to spend a lot of time with my back to you. Sorry about this. So what we have here is ancient medicine. So in the old days, they had no idea about infection, they had no idea about immunity, they had no idea about much of anything. They thought infection was due to miasmas and disturbances in, in, your, in, your, in your sort of different elements. So this is some people with a fever, and here is the doctor, this is a doctor, and he's praying. Um, this is one of the most popular medicines, this is bloodletting, because obviously that would release all the badness from you and this is ancient surgery. So quite far off modern surgery, it's basically, well, let's get them out on the table, let's cut them out, let's not worry about washing our hands, and let's all have a good look. So you can imagine mortality was, was pretty high. And you see, the, you get these old videos of people getting amputated, and they could do it in under a minute, and there was no hand washing, nothing. Uh, medicines, pretty basic. They had to either taste nice, smell nice, or taste really, really bad, and often they were poisonous. Things like arsenic were used as medicines. And of course, we had no sewers. So people used their chamber pots, 
And when they were full, they just threw them over the window, and it didn't matter who was there, and it didn't matter what was in it. These brown blobs are what you think they are. And this is an advert, and I really like this advert. If I don't fall over, I'll read it to you. So this is, to be sold, luxury should not be outside your hearth, but inside with a two-chamber pot house. No more should your unmentionable parts suffer discomfort from frigid conditions, um, because your chamber pot is occupied by a sufferer of the piles. Live like the royals. <laughs> Comes with a window through which you can dispose of your, of your chamber pots. Also with a fireplace and somewhere to sleep. Because that's where you want to sleep, next to the toilet. So, let's look at now. Of course, things have moved on. We have medicines, we have antibiotics, which can deal with all sorts of infections. We have vaccines. I really like this vaccine delivery method here. <laughs> we have sewers to get rid of our waste, toilets. We know about washing your hands. You see these signs everywhere. We know it's important to wash our hands. And many of us, certainly in this country, will have access to clean water, clean drinking water. So this is the change, really. It's all about drugs, vaccine, and sanitation. That's great. We haven't got infection anymore, but we have got allergies and things now, haven't we? So while staying clean is great for being germ-free, is it the reason that we are getting more things like allergies? Is that the reason why our children are suffering from allergies? So just to explain to you technically, as an immunologist, what an allergy is. So your body's immune system is devised to recognize something foreign that is dangerous and respond to it and eradicate it. In an allergy, what is happening is your body is responding to something that should be harmless, and it's trying to eradicate it, okay? And there are lots and lots of common allergens that we're aware of, things like peanuts, cat, cat dander, dog dander, you know, from their fur, um, dust mites, that's what that is, that's a dust mite. Um, pollen, of course, lots of people suffer from hay fever. And these will cause a variety of symptoms. People get hay fever, they sneeze, people get asthma, they get eczema, there's a nice eczema rash there. And allergies affect one in four people in the UK, so they are incredibly common. Autoimmunities are also another syndrome where your immune system is going wrong. Here, what it's doing is it's not recognizing something that's foreign and attacking it, it's recognizing that something that belongs to you and attacking it. So if you think about rheumatoid arthritis, it's attacking things in your synovial fluid, and that's why you get the inflammation in your joints. And of course, you can't get rid of things that are within you and part of you. So what happens in an autoimmune disease is your, is your immune system is always going to get triggered to that same thing, that same self-antigen, and you will get a long-term response or a chronic response. Okay? And these are examples. So rheumatoid arthritis is the most common of the autoimmune diseases. This is myosina gravis, which is um, to do with acetylcholine receptors. And this is lupus, just to show you that lupus is a real disease. It's not just something on house. <laughs> and overall, these autoimmune diseases are serious. They're affecting 5 to 8% of the population. So again, very, very common. And this led a scientist called Strachan to come up with something he called the hygiene hypothesis. So he observed that children who were born, born on farms or in rural areas were much less likely to get allergies. He also noticed that children from very large family groups, again, were more likely to not get an allergy. So what he proposed is that you were, if you were living in an urban environment or you're from a very small family group, you were getting less exposure to germs, your immune system wasn't getting trained up, so you're more likely to develop an allergy. And he called this the hygiene hypothesis. And he said what we needed was a balance between being too clean and living in this... This is a cartoon version of... Right, so this is too clean, this is this very sanitized world, and you think about all the Dettol adverts and things that we see, I'm not saying Dettol's a bad thing, but you do see a lot of adverts, particularly in, in, in the winter months, saying you must spray down all your surfaces, you must do this, and all these antibacterial wipes. Obviously, you don't want your children to be too dirty, we're not saying they should be sitting on the floor and eating shit. It's not a good thing. 
But we could have a balance. It's OK for a bit of muck. And that's essentially says it. So low exposure to germs during childhood is preventing our immune system from becoming fit. This has then evolved, this whole hypothesis, to basically have a look at, at, at the world as a whole as essentially two worlds. There is the parts of the world that have allergies and autoimmunities, and then there are the parts of the world that have parasitic worm infections, and they don't really overlap which I can show in this map, OK? So here, the bits in red are the bits where there's a lot of something. So this is where there is a lot of autoimmune diseases. So you can see it's in, in the developed countries, countries like America, countries like the UK, and parts of Europe. The bits in red in this map are where there are parasitic worm infections, and you can see they really don't overlap at all. So I told you I'd get you some parasites in here. So this is a slide of some parasites. Oh, this is where I'm getting the all. Oh, this is fantastic. <laughs> Lovely parasites. OK, so I've got three little beauties for you here. This is hookworm. Um, this is a, a parasitic vampire that lives in your gut. Um, this is a schistosome. So this is actually two schistosomes, because what you have is you have the female, this larger structure, and then this little bit that's sticking out is the male. It lives inside the female's groove. I know, isn't it romantic? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is. Um, and then this is a whipworm, a close-up of a whipworm, which lives in your large intestine. Um, you don't catch these from eating meat. I think it's important to say that. These are soil-transmitted diseases largely. You catch this one actually from contaminated water. Okay. Um, so this, you will catch it from eating eggs. This um, is through little larvae penetrating into your skin. I can talk a lot more about um, transmission routes of parasites. I'm great fun. <laughs> okay. So helminths, that's what these worms are called. They've been with us. Forever. They date back to the time of dinosaurs. All animals have parasites. Worms are with all sorts of different animals. And they've colonized humans as well. We look at all the ancient human remains, we can see evidence of worm infection, usually in the form of finding eggs. Um, so we find roundworm eggs in Peru. Um, and if you look at the mummies, if you go up to the Manchester Museum, there is evidence of worm infection in those mummies there. And that was universal. That wasn't just in countries like Africa or South America. That was everywhere. That includes the UK. So, of course, Richard III, they found his remains recently. And then even more recently, they discovered that he had a, a really stonking worm infection when he died. It's not what killed him, because we know that, but he did have a stonking worm infection. That was roundworm. Um, if you look in To Kill a Mockingbird, which many people have read or they've watched the film, they make reference to hookworm infection in that book. Um, and the reason for that, of course, is that many, many children didn't have shoes, and the parasite is in the grass and the soil, so they were contaminated through the soil. And if you look at North America in the 1910s, 65% of children had hookworm. If you go up to the 1980s, that's dropped down to 5%. Okay? So what I'm trying to tell you is that worms have been with us until very, very recent history. And so that means that as we evolved and our immune system evolved, it evolved alongside fairly stonking worm infections. And we could be talking multiple worm infections. So now that we don't have worms in our life, does that mean our immune system has become out of kilter and the balance has been tipped? Can we see the reverse then if we go to other countries that, are, that still have the worm infections? So they did a study in Uganda. They treated some pregnant women with antihelmetics, so things that would get rid of their worm infection. And then they noticed that they were more likely to have children that developed allergy. There's a massive deworming campaign going on at the moment in Africa. They're trying to deworm 600,000 children. They have to take medicine twice a year to get rid of the worms. And now we are seeing reports in the areas where they've been doing this of increased incidence of eczema. Similarly, immigrant communities who move from areas of, um, of less developed countries to more developed countries 
all talk about how they get more autoimmune diseases, more allergy. That's published, and then also anecdotally, I do a lot of work with immigrant communities, and they're all very puzzled. They're like, well, I never had hay fever back home. Why have I got it here? And of course, I would say maybe it's the worms. So what do worms do? So here's your immunology lesson. This is the only really hardcore immunology you get. So essentially, when we talk about the, the sort of adaptive bit of immune response that will remember a germ, we talk about two arms. We talk about the Th1 arm. The Th1 arm is very, very good with dealing with viruses and things that will hide inside your cells. So for example, something like tuberculosis or something like flu, which is what I've shown you there, it's a picture of flu. Okay? Then we have this other arm, we have the Th2 arm. This is very good at dealing with parasitic worms. This is a, a parasitic worm load from one village. That's not noodles, that's worms. I get them in wherever I can. If you have a high Th1 response, this downregulates your Th2 response, which is off. And the reverse is true. If you have a high Th2 response, that will switch off your Th1 response. Now, what's striking is allergies are generally associated with a high Th2 response, the bit of immunity that we essentially created to get rid of worms. And a lot of autoimmune diseases are associated with a high Th1 response. Not all of them, but a lot of them, OK? That's as much immunology as I'll give you. Be kind. So does that mean we can manage allergies and autoimmunity by using worms? And this is where it's been looked at most. So what they started doing is they did animal trials and they've tested all sorts of parasitic products and worms and showed that they did seem to have some effect. So then they took it and the first human trials were done in a disease called inflammatory bowel disease. Now inflammatory bowel disease is, is one of these conditions that people are embarrassed to talk about but it affects 250 people in the UK. Broadly speaking, it's two conditions. There's ulcerative colitis, which is inflammation of just the large bowel, um, and you get these ulcerations forming. And then there's Crohn's disease, which is actually inflammation in any part of the bowel, all the way from the mouth to the anus, and it can be skip lesions, so you get these sort of gaps of completely healthy tissue. And you also get these really quite unpleasant fistulas, we call them. They're wounds that penetrate all the way through the layers of the gut. These diseases are a response to the gut bacteria, and they are what we call relapsing and remitting. Like many autoimmune diseases, you have periods where you feel better, and then you have periods where you're not feeling very well. And they manage it, or they try and manage it, with anti-inflammatory drugs to suppress the immune response. But the patient response to these are variable, and they have to go through lots and lots of invasive procedures to monitor their condition. And there is a high risk of surgery surgical resection, and there's also a risk of cancer. So they're really unpleasant diseases, so it's really important that we find better ways to manage them. So this is where they looked at worm therapy. So they did some clinical trials, and they gave patients with these diseases whipworm eggs, TSO. The whipworm eggs were not from humans. The whipworm eggs were from pigs which means they cannot survive in the human host. This is a picture of, a, of an egg. You can't actually see them by eye. And actually, this is not an infective egg. So if there is a parasitologist in the audience, I'm just pointing out that I know it's not an infective egg. Um, and that's what it would look like if it could grow up, but that one wouldn't. The eggs were very, very well tolerated, so they didn't make people feel unwell. And surprisingly, they did cause remission. Um, just one dose caused remission. Of course, you will have to keep redosing because the infection will not last. And this has turned a whole tide of different worm therapies coming out. So people have looked at it in a whole host of other diseases. There's interest in allergies, there's interest in asthma. These are some headlines about that. Um, things like MS, all sorts of things. But really, the biggest effort is definitely inflammatory bowel disease. And at the moment, there are multiple trials happening in America, much larger cohorts of, of of um, patients. In fact, one of my ex-PhD students is actually involved in one of those trials in New York. I'd just like to say, we haven't really got a clue what the mechanism is. This is what's scary. Out doing it to patients, we don't really know what's happening. So one idea is that worms have evolved to live for years and years and years inside a human host, 
And what they must do is therefore hide a little bit from our immune system. And certainly some worms are able to sort of squash down the immune system, which obviously is for their benefit, so they can live in us for a long time. The other idea, of course, remember I told you about the Th1, Th2 imbalance, is that perhaps worms are tipping the balance. So if you have a really horrible Th1 response that's giving you your autoimmune disease, they might be tipping it back up and giving you some kind of equilibrium. Alternatively, they could be kind of directing the immunity away from, say, your allergy by giving it a proper worm to deal with instead of some pollen. That's the sort of ideas and there's various cartoons, but we really don't fully know. And there's another issue. People aren't deworming children, 600,000 children, for fun. Worm infections do cause pathology. They're not nice. This is a little girl standing on some bricks. This is her tummy. This was what was in her tummy. This is roundworm. That's one girl. Many kids will have more than one infection. It affects children much worse than adults, possibly because adults have developed some kind of immunity. And what can happen in children that have a worm infection is they will have stomach pain, they may have diarrhea, they may be malnourished, they may be anemic, they will feel tired, they will feel horrible. They just don't feel well, and they don't go to school. And of course, this traps people in poverty. It's the most important reason that children don't get an education in, in third world countries. That's why people are being dewormed. The best way to get people back to school. It's really shot up attendance rates in school. And there's another problem. People don't respond the same to a worm infection. So remember, I told you the Th2 response, very good for dealing with worms. There'll be a quiz on this later. Th2, what is it? If you have a Th2 response, you'll be resistant to a worm infection. You will push the worms out. They will not survive in you for any length of time. So you'll be fit, you'll be well. Your gut will look like this. Nice empty gut, okay? But some people and some animals have the wrong immune response, and for whatever reason, they will have the Th1 response. This means they are susceptible, they get on well, they have a chronic long-term worm infection. It doesn't give them a bad nose, I just like, like the picture. But the gut will look like this, okay? These little strings are whipworms hanging out of a gut. And we don't fully understand why that happens. So it could be quite risky giving somebody who's already got an aggravated gut a worm if they fall into this group of people. And this is where I get really gorgeous. If you want to close your eyes, there is going to be a video of some worms. Right. So I'm going to click, and it's going to move. <laughs> OK. This is Trichuris dysentery. This is heavy whipworm infection. So this is in the large bell. These little curly things that are slightly out of focus, I must admit, this magnification, are whipworms. There's ulcerations, there's mucus. Actually, a chronic worm infection, I know it's disgusting. <laughs> a chronic, I'm so used to it though. <laughs> a chronic whipworm infection looks a bit like inflammatory bowel disease. So the, it just shows you it's not good. It's gone, okay? Look again. So are worms really a friend or are they actually an enemy? And then you have this other issue. You have this issue of self-treatment. So some people, no matter what, they're so desperate, they're, they're completely refractory to treatment, they're not responding to the drugs, they've heard that worms could be good, they go out and they self-treat. This is not being managed by scientists, it's not being managed by doctors. They are seeking treatment, and God knows what they're giving themselves. They may not be giving themselves infective eggs, for starters, because not all eggs are infective. They may be giving themselves dangerous quantities of parasite, they then share their experiences via blogs and the web and encourage other people to do it. And then there's this huge black market in worms. It can cost you hundreds of thousands of dollars to give yourself a worm infection that actually, if you walked around Africa barefooted long enough, you would catch naturally. There's only been one study that I'm aware of that actually monitored somebody who's self-infected. So it can be costly, and if they are the wrong person and they're getting the wrong kind of infection, it could be incredibly dangerous. So it is worrying. 
So I'm sort of wrapping up now, and I'd sort of like to say, I think there is something to be learned from worm therapy. But I think we have to think very, very carefully about what we're doing with it. So one thing is we need to define the qualities of the worms that we're using. So we have to be sure that the worms are the right worms and not worms that can cause a really serious disease. So, for example, schistosomes cause, cause bilirazia, which can be fatal. Also, you have to look at the dose of worms. So there was a professor in, in Nottingham, and he was interested in using hookworm infection, so they all infected themselves with hookworm. If they had 50-plus hookworm, they felt rotten. If they had 10, they didn't feel too bad. They could get about their business. So the dose is quite important. You also need to know which patients are going to be the right ones to treat so that you aren't going to make a patient sicker. And that's where my research is particularly involved. I'm looking for biomarkers, things that I can trace in either feces or serum that will say this patient is the right patient to be getting this treatment. And that can also be used to manage inflammatory bowel disease. Or you don't need to have a worm. Parasites make lots of stuff. Some of those things could be helpful to us. So there's a lot of interest in looking at the parasite products that are most beneficial. Manchester Immunology Group is one of the places that's doing that. There are other institutions around the world, but it was an excuse to show some of the people in my institution. OK, so I've wrapped it on quite a lot about worms. So I will leave you with the last picture of worms. Thank you very much for listening. You may want to wash your hands. <laughs>